Design Development School of Architecture of the University of Virginia, and she's an honorary professor at the Urban Institute in the UK, an environmental psychologist and formal head of landscape architecture and in international practice. She's written extensively on the impact of the environment on health and well-being, including with the World Health Organization, Emily Lansing. Jenny has over 15 years of experience in use of restorative environments, and her book, Restorative Cities, Urban Design for Mental Health and Well-Being. We invited uh, Dr. Rowe here. It's kind of a timely time for our city. We grow rapidly, and we want to maintain our cultural roots and our soul, if you will. And we hope that her message kind of resonates with a, uh, a number of you. Uh, we'll be using a panelist format. Uh, Jenny will speak for 25 minutes or something like that. And then we'll go into a panel format with a, uh, a panel of three with the moderator. So without further ado, and Jenny, we took a tour of the city this morning. So we did a trolley tour where she got a look at the Rosemary Bay Park, uh, downtown, we got out to St. Armand to lead up. So she's got a little flavor about our city. And uh, I think she likes what she's seen so far. So uh, really a, a, an honor and pleasure, uh, Jenny, to introduce you and ask for your remarks. Thank you so much. Just about medication or therapy, 
although I would say having good access to mental health care is obviously essential. But some um, statisticians put the contribution of health care to health at 10%. Um, and what we've been exploring in my world and in public health for the last, let's say, 10 years or so, is a wider public health approach that involves a role for the built environment. So, so far, urban design strategies in the US have been very largely driven by a physical health motive. Design for active living has gained momentum here. You see it in cities like New York, Chicago, Portland, and you see it here in Sarasota. Building and designing the community to make it walkable and cyclable. Um, but I would argue the focus on mental health has largely been ignored. And I think this is the right time to be having that conversation owing to coming out of a pandemic and the tsunami of mental health issues that we as a society are now facing. So restorative cities is really driving a shift or aiming to drive a shift in city design towards mental health. Next slide, thank you. Uh, the framework, um, it's up here, it's also on, um, on the, the poster there, um, is a new concept that puts mental health, wellness and quality of life at the forefront of city design and planning with the seven pillars illustrated here. I'm going to take you through each pillar and explain what, what each pillar is. The critical thing about the book is that it's what I call evidence-based. It's building off literally thousands of studies in restorative environment research, drawing from psychiatry, geography, architecture, design and planning, public health, engineering, and far more, which we, uh, Leila and I, have brought together to show how these certain attributes can support recovery from mental fatigue, from attention deficit, depression, stress, and anxiety. This is a really critical point about the book, because if we're going to solve mental health issues, we have to work with people in public health and medicine and psychiatry. Those people really need uh, scientific, robust evidence. And as a researcher, um, a large part of my energy goes into driving that research. Next slide, please. All right, the green city. Uh, this is the first attribute I'm going to talk about. It's the most robustly evidenced attribute in the book. Um, and what the research has shown over a number of years is that access to green space, public parks, pocket parks, can reduce depression and stress. It improves our brain function. Pretty amazing. I've done that work using EEG headsets and seen changes in brain waves when people enter green spaces. It helps manage the symptom severity of anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, and other severe mental health problems. It can also reduce heat stress, a problem I suspect here in Sarasota, <laughs> and it can improve sleep quality. Um, also extremely important for our mental health. Now, the impact of green space on our mental health is modified by a number of factors, including the amount of green space. It's accessibility, how close it is to your home, the type of green space, the view you have of nature from your bedroom window or kitchen window, your perception of its quality and your perception of its biodiversity value and how it's used, and the amount of exposure or what we call the dose that you receive in the course of your daily lives. Some smart researchers in the UK have estimated that we need a minimum of two hours exposure to green space a week to get these mental health benefits. That study has not been replicated, but it is an epidemiological study with a large number of um, people involved in that study. I do want to talk about inclusivity. Uh, and access to green space, but I'm going to save and part that piece when we get on to the inclusive city. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. This is an extract from the book. It's a little hard to see on the screen. Um, the reason I'm showing it to you is because every chapter has this same format. And we've done a lot of work, or well, mostly I did the graphic work, 
trying to make these principles very easy and accessible for both my students, for people like yourself, people in the public, the lay public, for our leaders in cities. I want them to be able to grasp the principles and benefits of these attributes really easily. So the first of all, the first image there on your left, uh, is setting up the mechanisms by which a restorative attribute delivers its benefits. The next slide, moving along, left to right, is setting out the evidence um, showing the mental health benefits, and they include very many social benefits. And then we come on to some design guidelines at a neighborhood and city scale working um, and setting out um, a range of principles. Another important thing about the book, I'd say, is it's not a rule book. I work with architects and urban designers. They don't want rules. They want to be creative. I, I, I lived and married an architect for 20 years. I know that they don't want to be told what to do. So they're not rules. They are designed to be interpreted flexibly. And that's really important if you're a designer in the audience that you appreciate that point. Our next slide, please. Thank you. Now, this is Sheffield. Um, I grew up not far from Sheffield in Yorkshire. Um, and they have probably one of the few blue city master plans I've ever seen in the world, actually. And this is a station, and this is an acoustic screen that drowns out the sound of the road. Now, I've been hearing some issues about acoustics in your city today. So you have to think creatively about how you use water. It's not just your waterfront. There are other scenarios and options you might choose. So, the blue city, possibly the most restorative attribute um, in our framework. Contact with urban water, be it in a fountain or a waterfront or a seafront, brings much the same benefits as green space, as, 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 as nature, um, you know, we've already talked about the benefits of green space. So, a reduced risk of depression, increased uh, attention, reduced stress alleviation, and so it goes but less well evidenced than the benefits of green space. So what is it, since you are a blue city, what is it about water that is so special? Well, it's an increased opportunity for what I call fascination. I'm going to talk a little bit more about fascination in a moment. Fascination is another word for curiosity. Water engages the brain. It's distracting, it's curious, it's fun to touch and play with. You see it change pattern as it falls over different surfaces. It interacts with the light. It's a dynamic attribute, much like trees and nature in our environment. And this is what makes it more restorative, let's say, than a mural or a static piece of artwork. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> So the sensory city, this is London Derry in Northern Ireland. Um, much less evidence as to the benefits of sensory design to mental health. We gather them in the book. Some of them include reducing unpleasant noise, designing positive soundscapes, sonic refuges, water, for example, bird sanctuaries, the pleasant sounds of nature. Increasing opportunities for access to healthy food, the smell of that food, positive auras. How often do you think about the smells of Sarasota as you drift through its, its, its streets? Smell harnesses feelings of belonging and place identity. Super important but often <coughs> forgotten. And then increasing visual complexity. This may hold one key to reducing depression and suicide, which brings me onto the image in this slide. It's showing you an interactive lighting design for a bridge in Londonderry that has a high experience of suicide. Um, the light, can you see the light on the bridge? Those are actually sheaves of light that can be manipulated using a smartphone. Now what Leila and I have posited is that the use of the phone and the manipulation of the light increases cognitive engagement with that artifact. It causes a kind of aesthetic distraction and it's significantly reducing suicide here. So one smart way of, of, of reducing suicide is to really engage people with their environment. Next slide please. Everybody hearing me okay? 
Fantastic. Uh, okay, so here we are now in Hong Kong, uh, which is where Leila worked for a while, um, a neighbourly city. Here in this chapter, we look at how urban design can be used to build social networks. We have seen how important the outdoors is to social networking during COVID. It's often the only place where many of us felt safe to be and to meet our friends and our neighbours. And those of us who have supportive social relationships are less likely to develop mental health problems and more likely to recover from them quickly. So some of the attributes in the book we talk about for fostering social interaction we have called bumping places. The value of impromptu encounters. You can probably all relate to this. People you meet at the market, the coffee shop, the dog park, if you have those here. Um, and how often do you meet people you know on the street here? A lot, a lot. And also, for, for people, particularly people who are suffering from loneliness, people who live on their own, I live on my own, just going to a coffee bar and having a conversation, a chat with a barrister about how you are, how the weather is, is super important, particularly if you're isolating or you've been quarantining during COVID, of which I did a large amount. Um, Housing, super important, obviously, is a major factor um, in promoting social interactions, the importance of neighbours. Again, that became much more important during COVID. How reliant were your neighbours? How much could they support you if you were isolating? And then getting back to parks and green space and community gardens. This is a fairly surprising piece of evidence, I think, but parks do foster empathy altruism, increased trust in a neighbourhood, and a better sense of belonging and social interaction. I find that really interesting. Um, okay, I think we'll move on. Thank you. So I talked to you earlier about the active city and um, the fact that the US is making real strides, I think, in design for the active city. By that I mean creating walkable neighbourhoods, you have them here in Sarasota, <coughs> increasing the number of bike lanes, allowing for comfortable or what I call multimodal streets. And this has a huge benefit on physical health and the prevention of disease, particularly cancer and cardiovascular disease. But physical health doesn't operate in isolation. Health is an interrelated concept. And we really need a whole health active living strategy towards the design of our downtowns. So there's a huge host of mental health benefits associated with being active. Um, it includes a reduced risk of depression and anxiety, improved stress regulation, really important for our children and our older people, our um, association with improved brain health and memory functioning. These all play a significant role in healthy ageing and healthy child development. Now, I haven't seen many children downtown in Sarasota today, <laughs> uh, which is something I'd like to come back to. There's really strong evidence to show you expose young children to nature, to public parks, they will have a protective benefit. They will have a reduced risk of experiencing a mental health problem later in life. Very powerful evidence coming from Scandinavia. A lot of the work that I do um, was also done in places like Scandinavia where exposure to green space um, is really very prominent in, in their environment. Um, oh, all right, anything else to say about the active city? Um, Barcelona. Um, this is a, what's called a super block. It's a model you might want to look at a little bit more closely for Sarasota. What's critical to its success is this is mixed use communities. This is a multimodal street you see here, a comfortable street. The streets are well connected. Um, this block includes subsidised and integrated public transit, free transit, and of course you can see street trees and urban greening, and most importantly, play facilities. Can you see that in the slide? Um, so Barcelona is moving with this model at a pace that's unbelievable. It's bringing about real, real change. You might also call it a 15-minute neighbourhood. 
Um, a city here in the US that is replicating this model um, is Utah. It's, it's, I read something in Bloomberg News recently to show that they are also creating a 15-minute city and making gigantic strides in reducing vehicular traffic in their city. Utah. Salt Lake. Salt Lake. Utah's a state, of course. Thank you. I've not been there. I need to go there. Clearly. Uh, all right, next slide. Okay, so I think we're on to something a bit more novel here um, that you may not have heard about. Um, play. Play, the need for play does not just end when we hit 13, all right? All of us, whatever age we are, need environments that engage our senses, our curiosity, our imagination, and our creativity. Um, so in the book, we very much argue for an all-age approach to the playable city. Um, it's often really only uh, dealt with in relation to children, and even teenagers, I think, get missed out when we talk about play. So we define the playable city as having two main characteristics, what we call pure play context. The props and context designed specifically for play. Playgrounds. I saw them in your parks today. Standard, you know, play areas, off the peg design play equipment. Uh, the net there is in Germany. Um, that's an example of a pure play concept, um, context. But we have other playable contexts, not designed for play, but in which playful activities can take place. Interactive art exhibits and opportunities for what I call play appreciation. I haven't seen any of that in the city. I've seen nobody skateboarding, nobody free running or doing parkour. That's unusual, I think, for, for a big city. Um, there we have somebody doing something rather unusual on a wire. That's in Edinburgh, where I come from. And then below him are two teenagers engaging in what we call urban health games. So using technology to get teenagers moving out on the streets, interacting with their environment, but kind of using their phone to tag things, to get points when they find things in the environment. A really novel and exciting way to engage youth with our cities. So I think there's a wealth of ideas in the playable city for you here in the Sarasota. Um, finally, just Chicago, uh, the Bean, uh, is an example of how an interactive art exhibit can really appeal to our imaginations. You stand in front of it, you see yourself and the city in a completely different light. It kind of distorts the image and it's really fascinating. Back to that quality of fascination. How are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, not much further to go. Um, all right, so next slide. <coughs> This is the final attribute, but probably, arguably, the most important attribute, because nothing, none of the other attributes will work unless they are dealt with inclusively. Um, so we interpret inclusive design as design for all ages, all genders, all races, ethnicities, etc., etc., and also for the full diversity of physical, sensory, and cognitive abilities and needs. And that piece does get left out quite a lot when we talk about inclusive design. Unfortunately, we also all know that urban design has contributed to segregation, exclusion, and prejudice in our cities. And this really has um, a strong impact on people's self-esteem, a sense of belonging, their dignity and independence, as well as their ability to access the full range of a city's educational, economic, social, cultural and health opportunities. Um, so how do we build the inclusive city? Well, you have to start with the people and you have to co-create inclusivity with the, with the people you're designing for. I think it's the number one fundamental thing um, that has changed in urban planning over the last, let's say, 30, 40 years. Um, it's, it's designing with the community and that can be hard to do but it's super important in that neighborhood feeling inclusive, feeling they have a sense of belonging and they have a sense of ownership of that environment. Okay, next slide. Thank you very much. All right, so I was going to come back to fascination. Um, the other key thing about the book, I would say, as well as it being 
really scientifically evidenced is it builds on a very strong theoretical framework. I'm a researcher, I have to use theory in my research and advance that theory. And restorative environments um, postulate that there are four attributes of the environment that support our mental health. You might call these psychological attributes of the environment. The first is fascination. I think that word probably resonates with you all. Yes? It's our sense of curiosity and engagement with our world. Uh, but it can be fascination through the senses other than our visual sense. Um, what's the next one? Compatibility. Makes sense. The environment has to have a good fit with your needs. If you're, if you're a mother with a toddler and you're, you're using a buggy, you might call it a stroller. Um, you have to be able to get around with a stroller. So the, the environment has to be a good fit with your needs. Being away um, is that sense of escape we get from our everyday. That's why nature and water is so powerful. You only have to look you know, at a tree and it becomes inherently fascinating and you get a sense of being away. An extent. Extent means looking out to the horizon, up and out of your context. You have a wonderful opportunity here in Sarasota because of the water and the horizon to, to nurture that sense of extent, that sense of being transported somewhere else to another world. It's related to being away. Now I'm often asked, particularly by architects and urban designers, what simple strategy can I employ to improve mental health for a community? And I say, if you can only do two things in a neighborhood for mental health, one is to increase its curiosity and fascination, that could be done in so many ways, with planting, with water, with colour, with art. We're going to be hearing hopefully more about that later. And second, to increase the opportunities for being away. Of the two, of the, two, of the four, sorry, characteristics, fascination and being away are probably the two most important. Uh, next slide, thank you. So I'm moving on. As a researcher, I'm always thinking of the next next step. I realised uh, the book that had maybe not articulated uh, an idea that I subsequently developed around restorative streets. So I'm working with a transportation planner at the University of Virginia, and we've set out our framework for restorative streets in that chapter, which is going into a book on mobility. It's a German book. Um, Many of the ideas are in restorative cities, uh, and we, what also I realised though with the book is I hadn't probably acknowledged the effect and legacy of Jane Jacobs on my thinking, and this is just a quote, I'll let you read it in your own time, but Jane Jacobs talks about the street being this intricate ballet of people, of dogs, of bikes, of strollers, and that is what you need to bring to your city. And you are doing it, I can see that you're doing it. I think that the children are one of the mission I would really like to talk about. Um, but fostering that idea for developing that sense of the ballet in your streets. Again, streets have become so important during COVID uh, as a place in which we socially interact and meet people. Next slide, thank you. Only a few more to go. I wanted to show you this because I think it's really important because this sets out the US NAIRS priorities going forward from 2021. This was a survey done of, um, I think they put it out to 426 NAIRS, 126 NAIRS replied, and their two top priorities going forward, the first was mental health, and the second is learning loss among young people owing to COVID. But, I don't get the opportunity to talk to mayors very often. How many mayors are really thinking about using their built environment and their city and the, the planning of that city to address this number one priority on their list? I'd really love to know. Um, so next slide, please. I'd also say right now, uh, the public demand for this, the public demand to be outdoors, to have better quality access, to have fairer access, I sort of come back to equity. Our green spaces in cities are not distributed equitably. And unfortunately, some of the people who suffered most during COVID had least access to those spaces. 
Um, so the public demand is there, and there's been no better time to really seize the day. Next slide. And that's really uh, my message to you today, is to, to seize the day. I've used this word from um, German, uh, Zikist, anybody German here? Do you know what it means? Uh, no, <laughs> not that German. Okay, so it, it means spirit of the time. This is, I believe, our time, your time. Um, I've heard today of some of the issues with real estate investors. I really think we all have to work hard to bring them on board in this visioning for your city, to engage them, to, to scale them in a way into mental health, and really um, for us all to dedicate time to growing this idea of the restorative city. Um, you can innovate, you can be entrepreneurial. I've seen that today in terms of your plans for the Bay Park, uh, extraordinary asset to your city. What you need to do is exploit those assets. But critically, and this is the thought I'm gonna leave you with, is connect them. Those assets will not serve their city fully unless they are fully connected. So somebody pointed out Pocket Park to me today and said the city didn't really want to invest in the Pocket Park because they were investing in this large uh, park down by the bay. Um, that just isn't the case and the evidence points to the fact that Pocket Parks really are valuable. The closer the park is to a neighbourhood, the better used it will be. But what they need to be is connected so people who do want to walk, people who do want to cycle to work, to the shop, can use those connected spaces. Okay, so, next slide. So, I'm gonna hand it over to John Thaxton. I don't know where he is, because I haven't met him. Uh, hello, John. Um, uh, and our panelists, who I'm assuming is sitting over here. Lovely to meet you all. So we have Mary Davis Wallace. And, uh, John, you're gonna introduce everybody? I will. You will, and we have William. William, hello, thank you for taking the slides. We did meet all. And Craig, Sarissa, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm really um, excited to hear your thoughts. So I'll hand this to John. And you're going to join us, right? I am going to join yes, you, great. yeah. But okay. I think I've said enough, I want to hear your thoughts. Are we going up there? Yes, I think all so. Alright. Okay. Yes, David? <coughs> yep. You know, I was apologizing for the rain, and I'm thinking, it's been dry here, we shouldn't be apologizing, we should be rejoicing, right? And we have this beautiful, re-nourishing moisture to this otherwise pretty dry um, soil. So, I'm curious, how many of you attended a, a Baptist church when you were younger? Okay? And the reason I ask that is because when, when I attended the Baptist church, I sat in the back. And I noticed that there's all the front tables are empty, <laughs> and the back is clustered, right? So I had a youth minister one time that took, picked up the podium and literally turned it and, and walked to the back of the room and made us turn our chairs around. So that now I was sitting in the front row of, of the church. And so I learned my lesson from that point on to sit in the middle. <laughs> that way, no matter where they were. Um, so anyways, I first off want to start off with thank yous. Um, uh, David Lowe, uh, Patrick Gannon, um, amazing job at putting this um, multifaceted um, tour together of our city so that we can all learn more. I also want to thank Erin McLeod. Erin, are you in the room? There she is. Yeah. Um, wonderful human being and um, she's affording this room to us. I'm a little bit nervous because we're in the Senior Friendship Center and they're celebrating a 50th birthday as a senior <laughs> thing. Um, that senior, when did that become senior? <laughs> All right, all right, I get it, I get it. So anyways, what I'd like to do is, I'm not going to be doing much of the talking, I'm just hopefully going to guide this discussion. And I thought the best way, and really the only way to do it, is to get is to kind of frame the discussion around these seven pillars that you, um, that you see here. And I don't know if any of you have read um, the book. I would commend it. I have read most of it, I will admit. I have not um, read it all yet. Um, you know, I didn't notice any accent when I was reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't there. But it does have English spellings in it. It does have English spellings. That's all that's right. I saw that. Yes. An E where there wasn't supposed to be. Um, but I have had the opportunity of hanging out with a lot of um, uh, new urbanists and people from the Council of New Urbanism, you know, the Duanis, the Calthorps, the Floridas, uh, uh, the uh, Flatters, the Zyberg. Um, and for years now, 
And I've never heard this topic of mental health included in this conversation. So for me, to have something brand new um, introduced to me um, through um, meeting Jenny through this, uh, through this publication uh, was really, really rewarding. And I hope kind of the, the goal here this evening is, I'm a big fan of measurements, and so what I would like to do is have a candid conversation with this um, august group of individuals um, framed around these seven pillars and within this community of Sarasota. What are we doing well? Where do we need to double down? And what are we not doing well? Let's not be afraid to criticize ourselves. And, um, and, and after all, I give you complete um, um, discretion to criticize as much as you wish, because I don't think we're going to learn what we need to do unless people are, are being constructively uh, criticizing what we, what we have. So I'm going to first introduce our panel. Dr. Rowe has already been introduced, but uh, David told me I first had to introduce my, myself. Um, so I'll start there. The vast majority of you know me. Uh, my name is John Thaxon. I'm the Senior Vice President of Gulf Coast Community Foundation. Uh, my family's been in Sarasota for a little over, I'm a fifth generation Sarasota, so we've been here a, a long time. I grew up in Central County, went to Venice High School, um, and got into the real estate industry really well. Those of you, uh, many of you know, I'm a county commissioner, former county commissioner. Um, I spent 14 years either on the planning commission or the board of county commissioners, so I am a politician. Um, in reform, I'm doing my best to, you know, act like a normal person as opposed to a politician, all due respect. Um, Mayor Iorio, you'll understand what I mean when you leave it. Um, and um, so that's enough about me. Um, I'm going to first off start, um, uh, you go by William, right? Will. Will. All right. Um, and it's um, Niels or Niles? Niels. Niels. And see, a good moderator would have asked that question before. Um, yes, Will graduated from the University of South Florida College of Medicine in 2002. He completed his internship and residency in general surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. It's a, um, a great part of a resume. Uh, Dr. Niels was an associate professor of medicine at Nova Scotia College of Medicine um, initially as a senior physician in the Florida Department of Corrections Emergency Center. That had to be interesting. Then as a medical director for the reception of Medical Center Hospital before moving into the ambulatory primary care setting. Uh, Dr. Niels is the founder of Headwaters Health Primary Care, care Clinic, where the focus is intensive, preventative, and lifestyle intervention to prevent and reverse chronic disease. So it's a perfect person for this panel. He um, enjoys time with his wife and his large family. How large is your family? Nine kids. You have, you have nine children? Yeah. Huh? It is, it is large, yes. Here's all your children. Yeah. It's Tom, please. He loves the outdoors and enjoys enjoying, enjoying the outdoors and various sports, fine arts with his wife and his children. I'll next, grow, um, next move to Mary Davis. Um, who grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. I love that city, funky city, where she developed a lifelong appreciation for the arts, architecture, and design. She has worked in a landscaping, as a landscape designer and urban planner in North Carolina, Florida, the United Kingdom, and Spain. Um, since she served as executive director of the public art nonprofit, Cary Visual Art in Cary, North Carolina, there she managed and promoted public art uh, collection as a premier art destination. Uh, Mary, Mary Davis specializes in arts programming, development, and fundraising, public engagement, arts education, and exhibit curation. Mary Davis holds a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from North Carolina AT, AMT State University and received her master's degree in urban planning from the University of Southern California Price School of Public Policy. She has also owned a home in downtown Sarasota since 2005. So you're a newcomer. Yay. Yeah, newcomer to Sarasota. <laughs> um, uh, Craig, uh, I know how to pronounce your name. Sarretta. Sarretta. Um, I just had a, a book there. Is a managing broker of Premier Sotheby's International Realty, Sarasota, Florida, the company's largest and most productive office in the state of Florida. He was recruited for this role because of his reputation 
for exceptional customer service and his extensive business, um, business background. Um, as a managing broker for a major real estate company, Craig displays exceptional knowledge of the market, market trends, and market drivers. So please join me and welcome these four really qualified panelists to this discussion. I wasn't really sure where to start um, until I heard um, Dr. Rose speak, and I thought we would start with the um, with the green element. Um, you had just recently mentioned the uh, pocket park versus uh, versus the the larger parks, um, and I want to kind of engage the panelists in um, kind of starting off with celebrating some of the great things that we have done. Um, first off, the Rosemary Park pocket park, which is fantastic because it was a citizen-led initiative. I remember when David called me about this concept several years ago. Um, I did not think it had much of a chance of getting off of the ground, but here it is. Um, it's, it's coming to life. And then also want to compliment um, the City Commission uh, for their incredible work on the Bobby Jones Golf Course, which will not only provide green space, but also speak to this blue space. Um, and so if I could start, um, um, if I could start, Will, maybe with, with, with you and kind of get your input on the values of these pocket parks and things like that um, and how you, how you see it in terms of uh, benefits to the Sarasota community. Well, through my career I've seen people without access uh, to green space talking about working in corrections and it really you can see the deficit that it has on their mental health and, and uh, can't hear. Sorry. I'm sorry. So throughout my career, I've seen people with without access to green space speaking about working in corrections, and it's devastating to people's uh, mental health. Uh, you know, time on the yard or being outside is very valued, and all the way to um, living in places that is essentially green space. I mean, I lived in the mountains, and I know the benefit myself. So the key, I think, is you have to be usable. So I'm very intrigued by the idea of pocket parks. So, where people can access them. As a visitor to Sarasota, I love the Bayfront um, walking space. Uh, you know, I spend time down there. But if people aren't able to use it, then you know, it's for naught. Other, Mary Davis, some thoughts on that, or pass it on Thanks. to Craig? Um, so much for COVID. We're just sharing this mic. Yeah, I think you know. We have a, an intricate park system, not just in our city, but in, the, in our county, right? So we have like 160 parks at our um, disposal in the Sarasota County area. And then we also have, of course, our city neighborhood parks. But I think that the value um, for providing this great space, Jenny, and you did such a good job of articulating this, and I was making notes that I now can't read <laughs> on this piece of paper. Um, but the value of connection. So we have some parks in our city that we can't necessarily get to very easily. Um, and we walk to them, but we also, not, we don't necessarily have sidewalks to get there. And I'm speaking, by the way, I work for the city of Sarasota. I forgot to put that in my bio. <laughs> I'm not speaking in, but I work for the city. And I run the city's public art program. But anyway, uh, I do understand this, that the connectivity challenges that we have are not unusual. I mean, cities have these problems, but we need to figure out how to get from park to park in the city. Now, the county, you have to drive, you know, but it's so worth it once you get there. But I think that's one of the challenges we have in creating our green city is that we have these little pockets of green, but we need to be better at trying to get us from point A to point Z. That's my theory. Thank you. So looking at it from a real estate perspective, it, it's, look at any city that is highly desirable. Uh, you know, they've got a variety of parks. Uh, you look at Boston, Chicago, New York, et cetera, uh, San Francisco. Even no matter how urban they are, if they don't have easy access and don't have a perception of uh, parks being available, uh, it, it distracts from the, 
sellability from a real estate perspective, from the desirability. People, whether they know it or not, there's a lot of things that draw people to move to a city. And without a doubt, this is one that is not talked about as much, the, the green space. It's subconscious. A lot of what you do is subconscious, right? When you're buying a home, uh, you don't think about, you don't articulate it. But many people put that as a criteria. So it might be a pocket park, um, it might be a combination, but it also has to be perceived as being safe, uh, accessible and safe. Uh, you can spend a lot of money on parks that are maybe hidden or closed in and people won't use them. And they'll, they'll discount them as far as that psychological benefit, um, whether or not they want to move here or buy here. So I'm going to um, ask Dr. Wu um, a question about, it's kind of jumping around here a little bit between this um, pillar of active and the pillar of, of green space. And as you correctly noted, and we are aware of this, um, the bay, the 53-acre redevelopment of the asphalt parking lot for Van Wezel into um, an inviting park that is free and open and accessible to all. Um, is not necessarily as accessible as we wanted because we have this major U.S. highway that cuts off our arts district, our downtown, and many, if all, if not most of our neighborhoods in the downtown from accessing it safely and easily. Uh, similarly, we have this amazing new growth happening in the northern part of, of the downtown area, and yet again, we have another state road, Fruitville Road, that is an incredible impediment for um, accessing these, these green space and these arts and cultural organizations. My question to you is when we have attempted in the past to deprioritize the automobile and prioritize um, bicycling and, and walking, um, we have activists that come out of the woodwork and just say, no, you can't do that. If, if you deprioritize the car, all you're going to do is create traffic congestion, and that is a greater a detriment to the community than cutting off these cultural and green assets to the neighborhoods that really need them the most. So do you have any best practices or experience on how to deal with these um, uh, well-meaning activists that are um, impeding this accessibility to parks and cultural amenities? I do think uh, the mindset in the U.S. is a single most difficult issue as soon as you overcome here and the reliance on your cars, partly to do with your climate, I understand, when you have a severe weather warning at three o'clock today, you might want to jump into your car, but it's changing that mindset, and I think until that mindset does change, it's going to be, there's always going to be barriers. In terms of precedence, there are some extraordinary precedents. So if it can be done in Bogota and Medellin, I really believe it can be done in Sarasota. So the mayor there, he closed um, a major highway. There's a Spanish word for it, it's called Ciclovia. My Spanish is terrible. I'm probably not pronouncing that properly. But other cities have picked up on this idea of temporary closure of roads on a Sunday or a Saturday to show what can be achieved when you close a road or at least reduce a four lane uh, I'm not using the right terminology here, but... So far you are. Okay. But take four lanes down to two. So you still allow emergency vehicles transit along that road, but you allow on a Sunday people to cycle and walk. So look up Ciclovia on Google and you'll see examples around the world. The other final example I'll give you is from Paris. The mayor of Paris won her ticket on the back of an urban design mandate to change that city for active living, and they are making huge strides. So if you have a team who might go to some of these cities, to Bogota, to Paris, to actually find out how have they done it, how have they made that shift in mindset, and who are the leaders, and, and, and who are the people driving this forward? 
Um, so a couple of examples. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. It's kind of a demonstration, a scaled down demonstration of what could be so that people can see the benefits of doing this and that's not necessarily going to result in complete chaos and anarchy with these <laughs> translation things. Well, that's right. Well, one other tip while I'm here. Um, urban plans, collaborative, I need to check on the name. They are specialists that could come into Sarasota they could do a temporary road closure for you. Might not be your major highways, but they could do it, and they and, and they have real expertise in doing this. Thank you. Um, I want to shift now to some of the um, sensory um, items in the sensory pillar, and I and I want to do this because just um, a few days before your arrival, the front page and almost the entire front page of our local uh, newspaper was dedicated to this issue of, of noise that we have, um, Sarasota is, is kind of the tale of two cities in many ways, uh, both in terms of age uh, disparity and also in terms of income. And there were, and has been uh, for a good while now, a lot of people that have been sensitive to the noise of the, of the city and are seeking some sort of remediation to reduce the noise. Um, and some of it has to do with arts and performances, and others has to do with automobiles that are now being um, made to sound, um, pretty much all the cars, a lot of the cars being made are sounding more like Carly Davison's. So, um, Will, um, I want to first pass this over to, to you, um, because you do have um, a little bit of, of, of a medical background, and I would like to get your take on the impacts to, the sensory impact to uh, the citizens of Sarasota, and in particular, how you view it from these various age accords. Um, well, that's, it's a little tough. I haven't looked that much in the sound, but you know, if you think about um, late night um, events or things and interfering with sleep, that's a big problem. Dr. Rowe mentioned the importance of sleep. That's a huge area of interest of mine, um, but stress, is terrible for your health. So if you've got automobile stress, you know, there's been studies done looking at people who live near railroad tracks and eventually they can get used to them, but their brain never really shuts down and they don't rest as well. So it's true that they can have detrimental impacts on physical health and mental health. Others? Hi, did you ask me? Yes. Oh. If you'd like to, you don't have I to have comment my, on everything, well, but I, I want to give you all the opportunity. I wanted to, to weigh in on one thing. Um, in terms of the active city and what is expected of our active city and our playful city, right? So I'm kind of jumping pillars. But it, it's all connected because if we have a playful city and we have things for people to do, but we also have a lot of people moving here to live downtown to be a part of this active city, but it becomes disruptive. So um, we have this dichotomy happening within our city where we have a lot of residential units coming down. We have a lot of them now, but we also have a lot of growth downtown. But we also play downtown. Um, and all of our public art it, it right now is downtown. So we have a lot of just art and culture and activity in our downtown core. Now we're trying to move a lot of this out into the neighborhoods in terms of arts and culture. But there's still a, a real struggle to unify or to co-create, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and how do we do that thoughtfully, where we do consider the disruption of, of noise? And whether that's reducing cars or getting rid of the, the noise, the, the experience of being downtown. Um, but it is something that's ongoing, and we have this, this very awkward discussion will happen every now and then in a public hearing. Because we want the growth, but we also have to admit that it's disruptive to have a very active downtown when you're when you're living here as well. So, Craig, you see this with your real estate clientele, right? I mean, everybody wants this active cultural um, place to live, um, but they also want their quietness. Yeah. People, part part of living in an urban environment is the activity, right? So, uh, Americans, myself included, are used to cars, and that's part of the activity. Uh, yes, people walking, sidewalk cafes, maybe kids on skateboards, maybe your kid will ride a skateboard uh, down the sidewalk, that'd be good. Um, I, I think that's all part of the activity. 
And I think noise is part of what comes with that and actually in many ways contributes to the energy of the city. But it's got, you know, how do you define the line, right? So, um, you know, you have the Thunder on the Bay with the, uh, the Harleys. Uh, the concept is cool. It brings a lot of people to town. Um, a lot of those people are, are you, you know? You, you know, it's not Hell's Angels. It's, uh, I know a lot of guys in $5 million condos that have Harleys. And that's part of the fun of living in a city. But if it's disruptive to people that are trying to sleep, somehow it crosses the line. The, the businesses downtown, the restaurants, they want the activity, they want the energy, they want the people walking, they want the cars driving by, and, and motorcycles or whatever. But at the same time, if it's too loud, it stops people from eating at their outdoor restaurant uh, because it disrupts them. I don't know how to define that, but I can tell you that, again, from a real estate perspective, when that line gets crossed occasionally, it's not an issue. When that line gets crossed uh, on a perception, an ongoing perception, man, Main Street's like, you know, oh, you can't hear yourself talk to the guy next to you. Then you got a problem because the businesses start losing money. When the businesses aren't doing as good, the condos won't be doing as good. The people want to sell uh, out of the condos to move to a different part of town or something. So, Dr. Rowe, do you have any words of advice you can hear kind of the, you know, um, the push and pull here? I hear it. It's a sensitive issue here. Uh, I'm going to turn to technology for some solutions. So, we are going to have electric cars. It's going to help with the noise that you're experiencing in terms of vehicles. Uh, I really think acoustic design is coming on leaps and bounds. I think there's no excuse for not making condos um, you know well designed with good acoustic uh, you know good acoustics that protect people from sound um, I think I do agree with some of what Craig is saying that I think you know if you come to live downtown <laughs> you have to accept that there's going to be some noise um, and if that's not for you then maybe perhaps you're not in the right place if you have the choice some people don't have the choice obviously. Um, I do think things like water, I, things like plants, the biophilic, the green city, can help screen out noise. So you really need to look to your creative designers, your technologists, to help solve some of these issues um, and bring more people, I'd say, to the table. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to make one distinction that was an experience for, for me. Um, many of you may remember there have been moves afoot for years, decades now in Sarasota, not just the city, but in the unincorporated area of Sarasota County to have noise ordinances that strictly prohibit uh, live music, which is, in my opinion, um, a person that's been enjoying live music in Sarasota since 1972. Um, <laughs> it, it's a form of art for me. So I went to the groups, they were having these benefit concerts, um, which I attended and I spoke at, and they, they called them, some, you know, that was the, the, the noise ordinance concert. And they told them, you've got this all wrong. you got this all wrong. You're actually losing before you engage. Because it shouldn't be the noise ordinance, right? It should be the sound ordinance. Because noise is to sound like stink is to smell. <laughs> Truly, right? Nobody likes noise. I mean, that's a jackhammer or whatever. Um, but sound can be... Our, our amazing Sarasota Symphony Orchestra. Uh, just the same, but I won't go into the, won't give an analogy for stink and smell. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably stumble over that one. But anyways, that's kind of the way I think we need to start thinking about this is all sounds are not, are not noises. And so let's be, you know, subjective about You know, it, it's not just Harleys and loud cars and, and people playing their music loud. Uh, you look at Madison's or any of the, the downtown places that have got live music, that without a doubt is a huge draw. It's an appeal factor, right? And if you confine that too much, uh, you, you, you eliminate some of the uh, appeal factor for your city. Um, but at the same time, you know, if they're jamming till 2 a.m., then, you know, it went the other way. So you gotta find that line. Sure, and, but remember, we do have a theater district. Uh, theater lets out at about 9.30, 10, and some of us like to get a bite to eat and listen to live music after that, so there you have it. Going to move on to, um, um, not that the other subjects haven't been touchy, um, but this one I find 
uh, personally, just a little bit more, more touching, and, and that's the inclusive um, nature of the city. And again, Sarasota, uh, tale of two cities. Um, we have been criticized many times uh, for our segregated uh, nature. And look at the audience. I think it's all white. Again, not being critical, just an observation. Because what we have found in, in Sarasota is that we will have important decisions that are going to have lasting impacts on our community. And we see the same faces over and over and over again. And we see a complete underrepresentation of, of minority communities and um, individuals that have not had the opportunity to accumulate wealth and have the luxury of time that they can come to these, to these meetings. Um, so I'm going to um, first start with, I don't want to do this. Um, well, how about if I, how about if I start, start with you, um, Dr. Rowe? Um, it's an issue here in Sarasota. It's an issue that we've been struggling with for, for virtually um, my entire life. Um, what, have, have you seen any good examples of, of I mean, the, the only way we're going to get inclusive activities is to have inclusive decisions. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we're lacking that. Um, any suggestions, any thoughts on how this community can activate those who are not active in the civic and public engagement process and decision making um, and, and get them to the table? I'm very careful about talking about race. Like, I mean, I come from the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, White Supremacist Act, 2017. Um, the university, I will just say, is turning its attention to really trying to build relationships with its community. And a number of African American deans and faculty and staff we've recruited since 2017 um, is, is really quite impressive. And that is, I think, what you have to do. You have to make sure that there's representation at all levels um, of, 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 of your planning authorities. I, I don't have the right terminology, I don't know what your board's called, but you need to make sure that people are at the table when you're talking about this. And I think this is not something that can be fixed overnight. Watching Charlottesville try to build its relationship with its black communities, it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, what I do see in Sarasota is a lot of energy amongst you all and a commitment and a compassion and a sort of empathy uh, to really build this inclusive city. And, and so I think that's a really good starting point, and, you know, but catalyzing it takes expertise. And there are, again, facilitators who can help you with this process of engaging with those communities, finding out what their needs are, their perspectives, but it does, I really do believe it, I can't do it as a white British person. I've turned down grants because I don't have the skill set to go and do that. You have to build that process with community ambassadors who are African American or Hispanic or whatever race you're trying to target. Um, so, but I am cautious. I don't often open my mouth about race in Charlottesville because yeah. it's sensitive. It's very sensitive. So Mary Beth, I want to put you on the spot here. Um, we have, I believe it's still up, um, in the Embracing Our Differences exhibit yes. on the Bayfront. I don't know, Dr. Roy, did you get a chance to? Okay, that's Ken it. is here too, so I might put Ken on the spot. <laughs> yeah, because I think this is just an amazing um, step yeah. in the right direction. So maybe you can give us some insight yeah. on the role of art in this challenging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I just want to mention, um, I'm going to talk about public art in a minute, but I also want to say that equity and inclusion and diversity don't just happen at the racial level. This is also about age. Mm -hmm. This is about um, where you're from. Religion. <laughs> it's about being Baptist or not being Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't raise my hand, but I know what you're talking about. I grew up in a Baptist church. Um, so we all do this, right? So we have, a, 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 we have an inclusivity, I think, um, bias. It's an unconscious bias. Uh, as human beings. And so I think being aware of what those unconscious biases are when you walk out the door every day is important. Um, but in terms of embracing our differences, 
and guide me, please. Um, but that is an incredibly effective um, vehicle for understanding how to tell that story. And many of them are, are created by children, right? So in a way, children can tell a story so much better than grown-ups. And I'm really sorry that, that you didn't see any kids, because they're here. They are. Yeah. It was they a school were. day. It was a school day. School day, and, and skateboarding is at night. Um, we do have a skate park. Uh, but, but this is, Embracing Our Differences is just one example of using public art as a vehicle for change, as a vehicle for that conversation, and using it as a language to um, include everyone in this conversation. And so, and we are working to, to bring inclusivity and equity into the public art program. And again, in terms of even, um, we have Project Pride here in our, in our city. And I'm incredibly proud of, of Project Pride and I'm incredibly proud of our LGBTQ community in terms of equity and inclusion because they are out there, they're asking for the conversation and they're waiting for you, you know, to, to show up. And so I think that's one of the things we need to be doing is showing up. Um, and so public art is a wonderful tool for that. And I hope to continue through the master plan uh, to, to push everyone in the city to, to move forward with that. And I think West Coast Black Theater deserves a shout out here. Absolutely. Because the work that they have done in their programming, their capital improvements program, yep. has just been um, uh, very heartwarming to see yeah. this sort of support for largely um, an African-American style of, of art, which we all find just amazingly entertaining and they're so talented. Absolutely. So, and performing art is, of yeah. course, another whole genre. Others want to add to this? Um, please do. Um, the only thing I would add involved. to that is to, to comment on the age. Uh, I think you'll see more diversity moving into the city as the age gets younger. Um, I'm seeing it now. I, I've lived here for 18 years. And uh, it was, you know, largely a, a baby boomer and older town. Uh, but now we're seeing a significant increase in the number of 30-year-olds and, and such that are moving here. And you, have, you do have more diversity. Um, I just recently uh, sold my house and, uh, you know, I had 21 offers, imagine that. And, uh, you know, three were uh, African-American and I think six of the couples were under 40. And, uh, you know, they didn't win the house because they all had financing and, and the people my age all had cash. And so it's hard to compete. And that is something that's holding them back. But if I look at the younger crowd, the, the six or seven couples, they were very diverse compared to uh, the average baby boomer that came in. So I think you will see increasing diversity moving into the area because we are getting younger. You know, 15 years ago, Lake Branch was the only place that was young. And, and now it's, uh, it's moving around. But to your earlier point, whether folks live here that are more diverse or whether or not they participate are two separate things. You know, how do you get people to feel comfortable and accepted and, and, uh, and have that, you know, comfort level to just come and participate? I don't really answer that. I'm not that person. The only thing, you know, working in corrections uh, for a long time, you see a lot of people, <coughs> more than race, I think socioeconomic is a big divider. So um, I think giving people opportunities to uh, to participate in success and prosperity, that's huge. So that, inviting people to the table that haven't had those opportunities. And then on the individual level, just little acts of kindness go a long way, opening the door for people, smiling, engaging people in conversation. I've always found to be um, tremendously impactful. So I'm going to add one, one um, of my own personal experiences. I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, maybe I've already done it. Um, but when we were trying to get input on the Bay, uh, we noticed the same thing. Same people, same skin color, same age cohort. And it dawned on us that we were expecting them to come to us. And that doesn't work. So when we took our um, input sessions to the microbreweries in Sarasota, we got more young adults 
th than you can imagine, right? It was packed, right? The Big Top and all those, it, it was packed. That's because that's where they hang out, that's where they're comfortable, that's where they can bring their children and have, you know, ping pong and things going on at the same time. And likewise, when we wanted to in engage the Newtown community, um, the churches, right? If, if you held the meeting at the churches, the attendance was just so much better. So there was a lesson they learned for us. Um, and the lesson is don't expect these, don't expect people all these individuals, again, of these of these different age, um, uh, religions, race, and incomes, to come to you. You know, you really. Our lesson was that we had we needed to find a way to get to them. Um, so I'm going to touch on on something, um, Craig, that you mentioned just briefly, and this discussion would not be complete. It's almost like no discussion would be complete in Sarasota these days without some mention of of housing for our, uh, our service workforce. Those individuals that are working at or near minimum wage, they are the reason that we enjoy such quality of life. They provide those, those services for us. <coughs> but more and more, we are finding those housing units further and further and further and further away from the urban core, which is where we are expecting them to work. So they're living 50 miles away from where they're working. They're spending more time polluting the air, creating traffic congestion, spending time away from their children um, just to get to these minimum low wage, uh, low wage jobs. So I want to speak just a, a minute and whoever would like to go first can please uh, go first. Um, some of the thoughts on maybe what we could or should be doing to um, but you're giving it to the real estate broker, right? Good. Yeah. <laughs> the guy that sells the million dollar homes. Right uh, yeah, that's all right. It's, it's fair. Um, yeah, so you, your thoughts on what we can do better as a community to uh, bring our workforce closer to the workplace? I don't have a good answer. Uh, it's, it's not a question that's just unique to us, obviously. It happens uh, everywhere because of values, land values, and uh, uh, the value of building something. Um, you know, you look at involvement from the city, you look at involvement from organizations, uh, like the project on Lemon, right behind uh, the Salvation Army. I think it's a great project, uh, you know, that's targeted at teachers and at uh, firemen and, and uh, people who are are not minimum wage, but they can't buy a $3 million condo, and we want them to live here. Uh, but how many of those projects can you do? One a year. Value? Sorry, one, one a year. It's one a year. It's a 9% low income affordable housing tax credit in Sarasota gets one a year. You know, so take my real estate hat off. The <coughs> definition of low income housing um, is kind of skewed. Uh, the formula that is used, uh, not by the city, but just in general, I believe by the state, uh, takes the average income level of the zip code and then takes a percentage down on that to calculate what uh, low income is. So for example, when Lakewood Ranch was getting approved for Waterside and it was announced what percentage of low income housing it would be, uh, you know, I think low income housing, Robin, you may remember, but it, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, low income was considered at that time, which is like 10 years ago, eight years ago, 370,000. And uh, being a real estate guy, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, you know, that's insane. But it was, the formula is wrong on defining uh, low income housing. Um, and that's, so how we approach that as a bigger picture community, the government, whether it's state, county, city, and everybody together has got to rethink that, you know, because to your point, uh, we want people at all income levels to participate and to be able to live nearby. Um, you, your, your $5 million condo won't be worth $5 million if you can't go out to a restaurant and have people to, to work there and to serve you, um, or your 50, whatever, you know, your $500,000 condo. It's all tied together, the entire community. So I don't know how we do it, but I know we have to do it. Well, my developer friends would not like that. 
I think it's what they needed to hear. I'm out of my lane, but um, you know, if you look at resort towns, uh, they are vested in bringing low income housing for employees. And so you have to find, I think, invested stakeholders that will come and say, we're going to have a you know, set amount of, in the community that is you know, providing those services to business owners. Probably would be um, you know, stakeholders. Dr. Rue, any thoughts on Sarasota's struggle with getting our workforce closer to our workplace? Or the, I mean, this is this is an area that causes a great deal of, of mental health issues. <laughs> so I am a researcher, and I always rely <coughs> on precedents. Uh, I was talking to somebody today about Berlin, and they have done this. They have achieved this through policy and rent controls, and. Um, have those mixed use communities that are so important for mental health. So we really should be a problem. Um, I don't have the solutions, but I do think you have to control. Um, also, one of the thoughts, repurposing buildings downtown, offices um, are not being used five days a week. Uh, we're seeing in London and New York, offices being repurposed for what we call key workers. Um, so I don't know whether that's an option for you in terms of empty offices playing low here. I don't think on a large scale it is. We, we uh, don't have, you know, there might be some small buildings, but to be honest, uh, Sarasota doesn't have a, a, enough office space downtown, uh, Class A office space anyway. We compete for it. I just tried to expand and uh, had to compete with a company and I lost. So it's kind of like the housing market here. So we don't have that, that benefit. Okay, I'm going to move back just a, a moment to the sensory because, uh, Dr. Roy, you did, somebody warned you that you were coming to the cultural city? Well, they warned me. They said it was the only place to come. The only place. I don't believe that, by the way. Well, I, I don't, yeah. I don't mean it. I'm just saying it's the best place to come yes. for, for, um, for culture. And it is something that has been a part of Sarasota since the very early days when Bertha Palmer uh, brought the arts into Sarasota, uh, John Rangling with all of his um, uh, circus acts, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to explore a little bit more of this role of, of arts in, in, in this community and how it is impacting the mental health of our community. And I couldn't help but notice when you put up that photograph of that bridge for a moment, I thought it was the Ringling Bridge, or I like to call it the Gilwaters Bridge, because those of you that are here know that the only reason that bridge is there is because of one guy named Gilwaters. Um, the bridge wasn't even in that location when John Ringling was here, but don't get me started. Um, but anyways, it, it's, a, it's a handsome bridge, right? It's, it is a beautiful bridge. There's hardly a photograph of the downtown that I ever see anymore that does not feature that bridge. And now the bridge is being lit um, with, you know, um, the national colors of, of, of um, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, and um, you know, I just think, for me, it was it was it made me feel so so good to see a public works project turn into a a piece of, of art um, that I think everyone in the city is is proud of. And if you think the traffic is bad with that bridge, you should see how it would have been had we maintained a non fixed band uh, bridge. So, Mary Davis. Um, some thoughts, and, the, and then, um, Will, I'm going to go to you next because I really want to hear a little bit more if you have it on the, on the, on the arts and, and, and mental health. Thank you. Um, the, the arts and mental health, arts has been a vehicle for mental health and, and, res, and restorative health. Um, and recovery for as long as the arts have been the arts. So, you know, I was thinking about this when I was reading this book. Uh, I've been reading this for like three months, by the way. So, sorry. <laughs> I loved it. Um, but the importance of understanding how to take a break. And you were talking about that, that slide that had the, um, I can't read my away. Sorry. Yes. Um, extent and being transported, um, and the fascination element of art, I feel like sometimes gets diluted with politics and 
and um, preference. And so I feel like that we, um, as a community, need to step away from the politics of, of arts and culture and enjoy what the arts and culture can give you. Um, it's not just what the city has in store, but it's also what, what you yourself um, are allowing yourself to do. And I mean that like, we have to learn how to step away. And we have to let art be that vehicle for us again, because I think we have it right in front of our faces. So, you know, I've asked this in my public meetings. I don't know how many of you have attended the public art master plan meetings, but, you know, we've talked a lot about using art as a vehicle um, for our identity as a city, but also for recovery and for just literally taking, getting away. And I think as from COVID, from the perspective of COVID, I mean, we've all kind of been in a, a state and we're not in a better state now you know, with things happening. So I, I would encourage everyone to use the arts, um, to take that break. And then when you come back to your real life, why don't you share that experience with someone? Does anybody ever do that? Like, do you go to the post office and you see a piece of art, whether you like it or not, but do you ever go back to the, wherever you came from and say, you know, I just saw this, this horse. Awesome. No, because we just kind of take it in and then we get back to our phones or we go back to whatever we're doing. You know, so there are some assignments that I think we're going to be, I'm going to be giving you as a community <laughs> um, to say, like, take this back and, and share it, you know, because that's part of our city's recovery as well. So, well, you know a lot about recovery um, as your role in the uh, Department of Corrections. Um, I just wanted to share one story. The Sarasota County has a, um, um, a policy that when they build a new public building, they donate, or excuse me, they contribute a certain percentage of the cost of that capital improvement to art for that building. And I remember when we were, boy do I remember, when we were building the new jail. Um, lots of controversy always about building correctional facilities. But near the end, when we were talking about the funding, um, there was a, a, a move to remove that public art um, contribution from the capital improvements program to build the jail. And the thinking was, is that you don't need or you don't want art at a jail, right? It's a jail. And my thinking was just the opposite. It's, it's like if there's any place we really need art is, is in a jail um, to, um, you know, not to, to hide the facility, but, you know, to be upfront and honest. So, did you see in your role at the Florida Department of Corrections Emergency Center a role for art that actually has transferable use to the community? Yes, so, and also working in just the general civilian community at large, art has always been therapeutic, both for the creator of art and for people that are oh, good um, point. For art, um, you know, consuming art or enjoying art. It, it, the person, I mean, in in um, prison, people um, people are you know obviously in a destitute situation, and creativity is a way to bring hope. And so I see I saw incredible amounts of art there. Um, and when you remove art from a correctional setting, it's really a bad idea. We have to. This is a different conversation, but the idea of uh, jail or a prison as a punitive place is what it's always been. But in our society, it really needs to be more of a reform place. And so bringing people that are hopeless, hope, bringing people, uh, you know, something to live for or strive for is a positive thing. And I think the correctional system is starting slowly to move in that direction. But just, you know, with my patients one-on-one -on -one all the time, we always, art is a tool that we use for mental health issues, anxiety, or depression, either creating art or taking in art that connects them to something bigger than themselves that helps them to view beyond their own um, limitations that they're in, whatever situation. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left, and I thought um, that I would um, have some last comments from the from the guests and from Dr. Rowe um, about kind of this scorecard thing with, with Sarasota with regards to um, building our, our infrastructure, our built, our bricks and mortar infrastructure. 
um, to maintain and improve our, our mental health and our, our physical health. Um, maybe you can share what you think are the things that we are doing best and the things where you feel that we need to, to uh, focus on and, and are improving. And then what we're going to do, uh, Dr. Bowe, is one of the things that we need to improve. We're going to bring you back and put you again to work um, in Sarasota and help us work through some of the issues. So um, you want to go first, Will, since you have the, um, the mic? What do, you, what do you think we're doing good um, from your perspective? And where do you think um, we need improvement? Well, honestly, you know, I'm a visitor. I haven't spent a lot of time to really speak uh, effectively, I think. I know I, I love this city. The arts are amazing. Uh, there's so many opportunities for culture events. You know, I, I couldn't wait to bring my family down. I love what you're doing with the Bayfront. Uh, you know, so every time I come down, I go for a run along there. and really enjoy that in the morning. I hope people get out and use it. It's just a fantastic um, place. And then the beaches, I mean, uh, beautiful. So uh, I think Sarasota has so much going for it, and you're facing the growing pains that come along with all of those assets. And I'm pleased to see that you're thinking about how you're going to um, do it wisely. So um, I think traffic uh, is, is a big issue. Um, the more in my mind, and this is my bias, the more you can get away from using single passenger automobiles, using more public transit, walkability, bicycles, I think that helps. That's, that's what I see. Mary Davis. Um, well, I did a quick SWOT analysis in my spare time. <clears throat> so I have so much spare time, and we all do SWOT analysis on the side. But you know, it's good for all of us to do these every now and then, is to see what our strengths and weaknesses are as a city. And for those of you who have lived in other cities, now I don't know if we have, are we taking questions, David? Not yet. No? Not yet. Okay. Um, we always seem to compare where we came from to where we are. So we are comparing ourselves to other cities, we're comparing ourselves to how Nashville is doing it or not doing it. How did Asheville to get where they are? I don't know, because it's my hometown, and to be honest, they have too many breweries, and don't get me started. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but we do that naturally, right? We just we start to see ourselves um, as other cities, and what are they doing, and what are they not doing? And I feel like we have a very unique um, legacy. We have a very unique uh, set of talents and skills as a city. <laughs> And I think we need to start capitalizing on those skills and on those on that legacy and that story. Um, and so I hope that through the arts we'll be able to tell that story, you know, a little bit better. And then the other thing I was going to say is, is the aging population that we have here. We have to realize at some point that aging population is going to turn itself in is going to turn over. Sorry. That's what my dad would say, well, not until I'm dead. <laughs> but the point is, is what is our succession plan for that next generation? Are we thinking about the succession of our next, the kids that are coming up, the, the young creative class, right? So do we want to bring that creative class to Sarasota, and how are we doing that? So um, those are the two things I really identify with and, and hope we can work on together. Maybe we'll bring Richard Florida back, which is, that is his, uh, his specialty, right? So to that point, uh, you are right on target with the, the aging and the transition. So you look at the statistics, and uh, I can't speak to Sarasota specifically, but basically baby boomers, there's uh, more baby boomers retiring right now every single day than there are dying. You have approximately four more years of that, right? right? So right now, uh, from a realtor's perspective, uh, we have a strong market for sure for uh, the next three or four years based on demand of retiring baby boomers. But uh, that starts transitioning very soon. And will the amenities, the appeal factors be the same for the next generation? No. You know, what was important to my parents was different than for my generation. 
My parents' dream was to live in a big fancy country club, which they never achieved, but that was kind of what their group uh, thought was uh, making it, right? And I didn't want to do that. Uh, but the point is what I find appealing is probably not going to be appealing to uh, the millennials and the other generation. So you do have to think about that. But there are some constants. And probably one of the biggest, there are two biggest cons constants we talked about is arts and outdoor activities, parks, right? The arts to me, from a real estate perspective, is absolutely critical. Uh, when I moved here, I could have moved to any city in Florida. My wife said, we're moving to Florida, right? And then it's up to me to figure out where we're moving. And I picked Sarasota because of the cultural oasis. I didn't term it that, but it was the cultural factors. I moved here from Atlanta. I had season tickets to the theater. I had season tickets to a couple theaters, et cetera. But the point is that the image of Sarasota was so strong between art galleries and and the, uh, the theater, and all the other aspect of public art. And sometimes I didn't like it, right? I remember the cars that were uh, sticking out of the ground. And, and I didn't like that. But you don't have to like it to appreciate its value, because there is somebody that does. I, I you know, lose it, if we lose the orchestra, you know, that's a big deal, like, to me. From selling houses, selling condos, that's not a good thing, right? And you can't lose all your theaters. It's critical to selling re real estate, the cultural aspect, and the parks. Um, Bayfront Park is like, in my mind, uh, it, it's a must. It, it absolutely is a must. When I look at St. Pete and some of the competing areas of Florida that we, we compete against, that park was needed big time. So, but it, the pocket parks are too. Um, so anyway, um, I think that those are the areas we have to focus on and we do a great job, but we have to diversify neighborhoods, neighborhoods like this, neighborhoods like Rosemary, neighborhoods like the Quay, we need all of them. They all need to be distinct, they all need to be individual because they appeal to so many different people. The areas that we are not doing good for my seat is in the biking and in some of the other traffic issues. Legacy Trail is fantastic and I like to ride on it. That's where I go to ride, because I don't feel safe riding anywhere else. And uh, I think that's a negative, and I think it, it's uh, you know something that the city has got to do better. Uh, but anyway, uh, those are the areas, and traffic on 41 and getting over to Bayfront Park is an area that needs some more focus. So, David, I should let yeah. Dr. Rowe. Uh, may we, um, uh, Dr. Rowe has had a long-standing commitment to teach a class, and that begins in about 20 minutes. So she's going to do that, actually, uh, in a webinar from the library. So we're going to um, thank her now and excuse her so she can prepare for her class. I know you'd like to stay. I would love to stay. Do I would say your single biggest asset in the city, your single biggest asset in the city is your community and the people I have met today and I hope to continue to meet, but you have such energy. I really think you can bring together extraordinary things here. And you already are. I've seen extraordinary things today. Well, thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. And, and thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and John, if you want about 10 more minutes to continue the conversation, but one thing I might ask on your tables is a little questionnaire asking about uh, your opinions on how we score on some of the pillars. So. If you could complete that and uh, return it before you leave, you can leave it. it's a very quick one pager, uh, just so we got some input on that. But a very engaging uh, uh, discussion here. And, uh, one thing I would like to ask a question for me: the importance you feel, John, on the panel is to the new Performing Arts Center. John is going to bring it up. Uh, yeah. Where, where we, we are with that and the importance of that. Perspective. So, um, just as one backfillery, though, um, the Legacy Trail has been has been mentioned, and it's um, well, it's a good example of what you just said. If, if we build it, they'll come. Uh, the Legacy Trail last year, before the downtown connection was made, had 525,000 uh, visitors uh, to it. The population of Sarasota County in its entirety is 440,000. So. Um, it just shows this community's appetite for that sort of uh, 
social contact with their, with their neighbors. So for those of you that don't know, um, I can talk about it now. I had one of those things that you sign that say you're not going to talk about something, which is really tough for somebody like me. Um, but I did. Um, the Sarasota Orchestra did announce today their, their new location. And it is going to be on the north side of Fruitville Road, uh, very near where um, um, Honoré and Cattlemen are out, out in that vicinity. So relatively close to I-75, um, a good distance from the, the downtown area. Uh, but it is on one of the most significant corridors that leads visitors from out of our area into our, our downtown. So um, let's maybe, if some of you have some thoughts on, on that, um, Will, I don't know if this one is so much for you, but uh, Craig, Mar Mary Davis, um, how do you see that impacting um, arts in Sarasota? And then, uh, Craig, I'm going to go to you, and how do you see that um, it influencing your business and industry, and other, not just real estate, but other businesses and in industries that are dependent upon a vibrant downtown. Um, I'll keep this short because I know we're going along. I'm sure everybody's ready to eat. Um, this is important. So, you know, the arts, the, the new Performing Arts Center is going to be a huge catalyst to, to um, advancing the cultural climate of our city and that is a huge plus and we can get this done hopefully they say in the next few maybe five years I don't know how long it's going to take them to execute um, this, this center but you know losing the orchestra is a big hit for us and downtown really needed the orchestra and I think that was a huge loss just personally I'm really sad to hear that um, I'm sad because I think that we need them as much as they need us. And I'm curious as to how successful that location is going to be. But at the same time, you know, we need to also understand that we can travel to see the, the orchestra outside of the city center. And I think one of the things we need to be doing is thinking about ways to expand the arts and cultural services we have in our city outside of the city center so that we can start to spread out a little bit more and spread those amenities into neighborhoods and into underserved communities. So in a way, I feel like it might be a plus because people will be traversing our city and into the county. That's actually the county, isn't it? It is, yes, that's outside of the municipal county. Um, to provide more cultural amenities, but I do feel like that the arts and cultural climate in our city is at a heightened state, and I don't feel like this is gonna, this is gonna be a downer for us. I feel like we're on a, on a trajectory to for, for a bigger, brighter uh, cultural future. And for those of you that are not aware, you, you kind of mentioned this in passing, we do have an initiative going on right now in the Newtown area called the Sarasota African, Amer Sarasota African American Cultural Center, where they're trying to do just that. They're trying to celebrate African American culture by highlighting the early um, black leaders of Sarasota and creating an using art as the focus to uh, to get that historic message to all residents of the community, Craig? Uh, you know, it's, um, I guess it's inevitable with growth. Uh, it happens in every city. You have a, uh, a perception, you have a, a value proposition uh, in within a city that helps to expand the value of the entire community. And uh, that's, that's what's happening here. You mentioned that we have to uh, you know, expand the cultural benefits throughout the county and, and beyond. And it is true. You look at the amount of growth east of 75, which you have more growth uh, north in, in Manatee County than you do in Sarasota County, but uh, the number of housing and the actual population growth is tremendous there. It'll be supported. It will have, uh, you know, a successful environment at that location. The people from downtown will go there and the people from uh, all the eastern areas will go there. And I, I, I'm not worried about that, you know, but I think that the city has to pick up and move on and say, okay, we might have lost that, we might have lost most. Those are important factors to, to move out there, but they're moving there for, for their reasons. And so 
what can we fill because we can't lose the perception we can't lose it's not just perception we can't lose the value proposition that is sarasota and a large part i am telling you um you know sometimes people look at realtors and say oh they're just about selling real estate you know put a buck in their pocket and they're all out of like that don't get me wrong but um, most of them are about community and realize that it is the value proposition of the community that helps to make our uh, our personal success uh, more beneficial. And I'm telling you, the cultural aspect, the artistic aspect, uh, all of it, being Sarasota is, is critical to that. But Sarasota's perception is so much bigger than the city of Sarasota. I live in Atlanta. Most of you know Buckhead, right? When I was a kid in Buckhead, it was about the size of the quay. Now, maybe a little bit bigger than that, but I mean, you get the idea. Now it's about 15 miles across, right? Because of the perceptual influence. That's what's happening in Sarasota right now. It's no longer Bradenton, Saras Palmetto, Bradenton, Sarasota, Venice, uh, Englewood, you know. Osprey. Yeah, Osprey, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's all termed Sarasota by somebody coming from New Jersey or Chicago or what have you. So the orchestra is still a part of that benefit, still a part of that image. But as we, we still have to refocus and put continued growth of the art in the city core uh, because that's the, the, the origin of influence. Please join me once again in thanking these panelists and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>